1, uh, the text I've been given, the main text, and we're going to uh, navigate through this whole thing. Now, uh, it's a common text, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, start on verse 10. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it had been declared unto me, unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the, the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you said that I am of a Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name now understand the context of this whole thing. Now the church had its beginnings in the city of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. And the church has spread it from the city of Jerusalem. That's why Paul says in Romans 16, 16, salute one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. The church of Christ spread it from the city of Jerusalem. And Paul personally planted the congregation in Corinth, so we're talking about the church of Christ in the city of Corinth. Now, Paul says this, now I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his authority, I I'm begging you to take heed to what I'm about to say. You are supposed to be speaking the same thing and there are to be no divisions among you. Now, how would there be no divisions? Because we're all speaking the same thing. If you begin to speak something different, then we are divided. Now, now, he says, now, this is what you are supposed to be. On the contrary to being divided, you are supposed to be perfectly, completely joined together. In the same mind, the same intellect, yeah. and in the same judgment, coming to the conclusion on what you are supposed to do. Now, what are we using to be perfectly, completely joined together? In Acts chapter 2, when the church was started in verse 42, uh, Luke recorded, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. If you don't have the apostles' doctrine, we can't be joined together. We cannot be of the same mind. You're not following the apostles' doctrine. They're teaching what they have handed down by what has been given to them from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit received it from the king. Now. They have the apostles' doctrine. Now, it's amazing in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that it's, they continued in the apostles' doctrine first, and when they got that right, the end of fellowship. But if you don't have the apostles' doctrine, there is no fellowship. No, and look, it, 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 uh, my fellowship is not based off my emotions. My fellowship is not based off my meekness. My fellowship is not based off my long suffering. I can only be meek towards you and, 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 and endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit only by the apostles' doctrine. Now, I can be humble in my approach and keeping their doctrine, but if you don't have their doctrine, we ain't got to worry about meekness and none of that. Because we're not in the same party. So Paul in 1 Corinthians, he's speaking to members of the church of Christ. Y'all be perfectly joined together. Y'all have the same judgment. And then he says in verse 11, it had been declared unto me. Somebody told me about this. Now, now we have some brothers out there that, that say, well, well, you shouldn't be mentioning names. Well, brother, if there's a hundred people over there and somebody has a knife, 
and you see me walking over there in the group of a hundred people, I would be very thankful if you tell me that his name is so and so, that he has a red coat on and some blue shoes on with some blue jeans. And if you tell me that his name is so and so and he's dressed a certain way, well, I can identify with that. And I can move forward understanding that it is that individual that's trying to take me out. So in the Lord's church, we have to let it be known who is the change agent, who is the spy, who has crept in unaware. Look, don't sugarcoat it. Let me know. Look, I'm only 34 years old. I'm really just getting started. It would be very beneficial to me if you just let me know. Let there be no contentious among you. And Chloe has let me know what's going on. Oh, boy, we need some folk that's just bold like Chloe's house. Tell me, tell me who it is. Yeah. But, but just stay tuned. I, I'm going to tell you who it is. Now, as we journey forward, in 2 John, starting with verse 9. Now, I know that. If you don't have the doctrine, I cannot greet you. I can't even shake your hand. I cannot reconcile anything with you when I can't even shake your hand. It's forbidden. 2 John 9 through 11. 2 John 9 through 11. What does the Bible say? Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ... Have not God. Have not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ. Yes, sir. He has both the Father and the, the Son. All right. If there come any unto you. Any unto you. And bring not this doctrine. They don't bring this doctrine. Receive him not into don't your house. Don't receive him into your house. Neither bid him God speed. Don't bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Evil deeds. deeds. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you don't have the whole doctrine of Christ, the apostles' doctrine, I have command from heaven handed down from Jesus the King to the Holy Spirit, to the apostle, down to the church, do not greet them. It's so serious where an apostle who's known as the apostle of love says, don't even let them in your house. Don't even bid them God's speed. Don't even shake their hands. And if you do shake their hands, you are a partaker of their evil deeds. Now, what are they doing that's evil? They're teaching false doctrine. Don't embrace them. Now, if you're trying to tell me to embrace them, tell me who gave you the authority to tell me to embrace them. John says, do not embrace them. Them don't receive them their doctrine is different they don't even believe that baptism is for the remission of sins how can we walk together you don't even believe in taking the Lord's Supper every first day how can we walk together you don't you you got instruments in your worship service you fall in the old pattern you're up under a curse how can we walk together what can we do together? We can't do nothing together. Yes, sir. And I'm talking about now in a religious stand, from a religious standpoint. We ain't talking about going to work. We're talking about church. Let's keep it in mind. Some guys, they trying to turn it into some type of civil thing. Uh, NAACP. We ain't talking about government. We are talking about religious matters. Don't try to sugarcoat it. Boy, these brothers slick, man. These brothers try to get around the truth, but I'm going to deal with that. But the Old Testament being for our learning. Romans 15, 4. And Deuteronomy 12, 8. It says, ye shall not do after all these things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. God is like, this has been a problem in the past. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where individuals did what was right, not according to his word, 
according to what was right in their own minds, their own intellect, the way they want to see it. You don't have scripture to back it up. The only thing you have is lip, tongue, and teeth, and that ain't going to get it. You have your own opinion about what should be done. And then as they went into the land of Canaan, the same problem occurred. In Judges 17, 6, in those days there was no king in Israel. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Reasoning once again, not according to the word of God, but according to their own opinion. And notice how the Holy Spirit says, there was no physical king in Israel. And see, having a physical king, uh, that would put some kind of fear into the minds of the people before you do something. You're going to be a little scared because you know that the, if you violate the king's commandment, that there's some punishment. Well, I want to let you know this morning that we don't have a physical king, but we do have a king. Now, when Jesus said all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, that means he's a king. He has rule. He has authority. When, the, when uh, Paul said in Colossians 1.13, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That means he's a king. He, he has a kingdom. He, he rules. He reigns. When In 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom. That means he, there's a kingdom. He's a king, so he delivers it up. He delivers up his people in Psalm 24. Psalm 24, when, when David prophesied about the king of glory, he said, the earth is the Lord's and, and everything in it, the world and all those who dwell therein. For he found it upon the seas and, and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or, or who may uh, uh, go into his holy place? He that had clean hands and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord. He, he's strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in power. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? David says, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, the king of glory, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah chapter 6, when the seraphim was around the throne, whose throne was it? The second member of the Godhead, the Lord of hosts. What did he do? He came down in human form and he fought. And they were saying now, the everlasting gates got to let him back in. We have a king. But you have some men that's acting like we don't have a king. And you know what? They done painted a picture of a lollipop Jesus. They done painted a picture of a, a pancake served Jesus. They done painted a, a picture of a laffy taffy Jesus that's all happy and never pours his wrath. But in Psalm chapter 2, Psalm chapter 2 verses 11 and 12, uh, uh, the psalmist warns us and says you better be careful. Psalm chapter 2. Verses 11 and 12, what does the Bible say? Serve the Lord with fear. Serve him with fear. And rejoice with trembling. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. Kiss the son. Lest he be angry. Lest he be angry. And ye perish Ooh, from you perish the way. Away. When his wrath is kindled. When his wrath is kindled. But a little. Just a little bit. Bless are all they yes, sir. that put their trust in him. Watch, watch what the psalmist say about the anointed one coming. Serve him with fear. When you rejoice, you should be trembling because he done granted you permission to rejoice in his presence. Look, the, the Holy Spirit said, kiss the son. Why? He might be angry with you. And look, it ain't a lollipop, Jesus. He's the Lord of hosts. Kiss him, lest he be angry. And guess what will happen? You will perish in the way. Jesus will throw you in hell. So you're going to tell me we have some men trying to reconcile with denominationism? Don't you know you have violated the king's commands? 
Don't you know you went against the Lord of hosts? Don't you know you went against the everlasting God? Don't you know you might perish if you don't repent? Brothers in errors with, with denominations. Brothers, when O.J. Hayward went and preached over there at the Impact Church, that brother preached faith only. He, was, he, he planted a seed. And that seed is growing right now as we speak that you can go over there and you can chill with them and you can preach faith alone and not tell them like it is. Brothers, when Rodney Doolin, when he allowed Ricky Rush to come into the pulpit and all of Central Point rejoiced, it was a man in the back lifting up his hand like something great was going on. Brothers, that was a tragedy. Brother, when, when, when Mike Cope just recently invited N.T. Wright and Angelic and Bishop to speak before the Lord's people, brother, that was a tragedy. Brother, when, when you have men like J.K. Hamilton that went over to the Concord Baptist Church, preached the thief on the cross, invited the man back to preach, teach to his people, then invited the guy from the community church to preach to the people, and then the community church and their singing group and the community church choir got together and sang a hymn. Brothers, that was a tragedy. And you trying to tell me that H. H. Clay got a problem. No, brother. If you flowing along with that, you got a problem. Danny Craig in, in Longview, Texas, just fellowshipping with denominations, even to the point to where you can just look up how he was at the Red Oak Missionary Baptist Church on a family and friends day because he's a friend. Brother, that's a tragedy. Those are men that have rose up, not against you and I. They rose, they've risen up. Against the Lord of hosts. And when you rise up. Against the Lord of hosts. He knows. How to get his servants. To rise up. Against you. Hoping you repent. Before you perish. So I say it. Because some brothers don't have backbone to say it. O.J. Hayward brother you need to repent. J.K. Hamilton you need to repent. Rodney Doolin, you need to repent. Yeah. Mike Cope and all those brothers, you need to repent. Danny Craig, you need to repent. Yeah. And anybody else, you need to repent. Brothers, time to rise up, man. Have some backbone about yourself. Well, what, what are soldiers at now? And Brother, this thing's supposed to be going all around the world. Where you at in Africa? Where you at on different sides of the world? Rise up against these brothers. Call out their name. Tear them down. Pick up the word of God and slice them. Warn the world. Warn the children of God about these men who have crept in on a world. Pick up your sword and fight soldiers. Stop sitting there crying, talking about they going to say something about you. Pick up and stop being a jellyback servant. If you're going to preach the word, preach the word. Ain't no time to be compromising. Ain't no time to be playing games. Ain't got time to worry about what you're going to say about me or what you're going to think about me. Yeah, I said it. All you brothers need to repent. All you brothers need to turn from the error of your ways. You have risen up against the king. You have risen up against the king. But it's going to come a day. You're going to meet that key. You're going to say the part with me. I never knew you. Brothers, it's time to rise up and tell them like it is. Secretism of denominationalism in the church is a tragedy. It's men that have risen up against the king. And if you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, pick up your Bible, soldier. Get on the battlefield and fight. May the Lord be with you. Let church say amen.
tell you what, this poor bit cooled off overnight, but I think somebody poured some gasoline and the matches have been ignited. I'm telling you, what a word, what a word. This brother said he was 34 years old. And when I was 34, if I could uh, I'd do half of what he's doing, I'd be uh, somewhere else, I'm here to tell you. But nevertheless, uh, we're thankful uh, for these great men of God, Brother H. Clay, uh, open us up to start us down. And uh, we appreciate for that. Brother Brandon Starling uh, has come to us with the word from the Lord. And amen. And uh, we're just moving on down the line, having a wonderful time uh, in the Lord. We know we're trying to get our new mic back up and running. I lost a little volume, but I'll just talk just that much louder. Amen. Uh, we're going to get ready to uh, introduce our third speaker, uh, and uh, I know we may be a few minutes in the hole, but that's all right. We're still making good time. God is working it out. Uh, our third speaker uh, will be speaking on the subject uh, of, uh, of uh, let's see, here we are, finding out uh, the who, uh, finding out the who of the husband of one wife is. Finding out the who uh, the, the husband uh, of one wife is. Uh, Brother Charles Pace, amen. Uh, this great brother uh, has been preaching for 13 years. Uh, he's married to uh, Sister Carolyn Page uh, for 35 years. Have 11 grandchildren. I got seven, so, so he, he, he jumped over me. But, uh, and four children, amen. He attended the Brown Trail School of Preaching, and he has been preaching for 13 years, and this great brother in the Lord from the Pleasant Grove uh, Church of Christ uh, in the Dallas area uh, will be coming to us uh, from God's Book Divine, uh, and he will be speaking on that subject once again, finding out uh, the who of the husband of one wife is, Brother Charles Page will come to us in his own way after a verse or so of the uh, collection that Brother H. has uh, collected. Page 700, 17, 700, 17. Keep reading. certainly good to be here this morning to share with you another portion of God's Word. Yes, sir. Certainly enjoyed hearing Brandon, yes. a member of the Memphis School of Preaching. I was a member of Brown Trail, and we would go down to get well and fellowship with them all the time. So uh, it's good to see that Memphis is putting out preachers uh, such as Brandon, who is doing such a wonderful job, and we pray that he will continue to do so uh, as he preaches the Word of God. Again, I am glad to be a part of this Texas Regional Lectureship, and I want you to know that my lesson was given to me a few days ago, and so I haven't had as much time to prepare as a lot of these brethren, but I did want to accept the challenge and be a part of this lectureship, and so I thank you for putting me on the program, and thank you for having me, and it's good to see all of you who have come out this morning uh, to hear another portion of God's Word. One thing I want to begin by saying is that 
You know, in this age of information that we live in, we have the access to a lot of information right at our fingertips. And the problem is that people no longer want to hear what the Bible says, but they want to know what does social media say about the matter. And that's a problem. With social media, you have to be careful about who you parrot and the information that you listen to. Because there are many evil devices on social media, as well as some that are good. And so you have to be careful about who you parrot when you go on social media. And the things that you get, the, the Bible has always been good enough for us, and the Bible should always be the thing that we turn to when we are looking to God's word or to hear from God. I appreciate Brandon and all that he says, and you know, I was thinking about that, and, and, and what he's talking about is, is certainly true. You know, when people uh, get bored with the New Testament worship, they don't need to change the worship. They need to change their attitude. Each one of us uh, must look carefully at our own lives. Before we were Christians, we were unaware of how many of our sins were disappointing to God. But we are no longer ignorant. In the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse number 30, we find that we're, God is no longer accepting the ignorance. God yes, winked at ignorance at one time, yes. but now it commanded all men everywhere to repent. And so we certainly appreciate that because there is a lot of repentance that needs to go on in the brotherhood. And, and when you think about all of the, the things that are going on in uh, our brotherhood, in the churches of Christ, yes. Yes. you know, no one ever sit down and studied the word of God and say, you know, we need a praise team. That comes from things that we like and things that we want to do. So again, that was a very good lesson that he spoke of and one that is well needed in the brotherhood. My subject this morning is finding out who the husband of one wife is. From the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and also from the book of Titus chapter 1, and verse number six. We find that Paul is the author of First and Second Timothy, and he's writing to his son Timothy in the gospel. And Paul has to leave Ephesus and go to Macedonia. And so he leaves Timothy behind to deal with the issues facing the church in Ephesus. However, Paul did not leave him without guidance. Paul gave him the necessary encouragement and instructions for the task which lay ahead. And the words of Paul to Timothy on this subject have been forever recorded in the epistle to Timothy and to Titus. The instructions he gave to Timothy concerning the eldership, he also gave to Titus in the book that bears his name. My subject for this occasion, again, finding out who the husband of one wife is. And the only way we can answer that question is by the Holy Scriptures. This is certainly a topic that is relevant in the church today in light of the fact that there are many views concerning this matter. Many have misinterpreted this text <coughs> Pardon me, to try to make it fit their lifestyle or to try to justify their particular situ situation. And if we simply follow the word of God and his teaching, and teach our children the same, we can avoid these problems of life later on in life. The youth of our church need to know that before they look for a wife, that God expects them to be committed to her for life. Where I teach, it is a multicultural congregation. There are white and there are Hispanic, and I teach the young Hispanic men. And I was just teaching them this Sunday about finding a wife. I said, you guys are young right now, but there's going to come a time that you're going to be looking for a wife. Yeah. And you need to know what to look for in a wife. Right. I think we need to teach our children that more. Yes, sir. One of the, the most important things you need to look for in a spouse is one that is going to help you to make it to heaven. Yeah. That's the most important thing that you need to look for when looking for a wife. And that's what I relate to them. Because when I was coming up, I didn't have that kind of information. And you know what we look for, brother? The finest woman on the block. 
uh, yeah. the one who was the smartest or yeah. one who had money or whatever it was. We, yeah. we had no interest in their spiritual condition, but that is the thing that we should look for or we should teach our young men to look for because if they find the right woman, the one that they're going to stay with in life, it does not mess up their life later on in life when they decide to become leaders in the Lord's church. If a man marries a woman who has not been scripturally divorced, then she's not truly divorced. She still belongs to her first husband, the previous husband. The Bible says, what therefore God had joined together, let not man put asunder, Mark chapter 10 and verse number 9. Only God can separate what he joined together. In our text, the Apostle Paul is discussing the qualifications of a man who desires the office of a bishop or an elder. And that he has to be the husband of one wife is one of the many qualifications that must be met. And this has caused much dissension among the brethren of the Lord's church. Now sometimes we make the Bible too difficult because it doesn't agree with our agenda. Or sometimes we seek to please men, as Paul stated in Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 10. But marriage is a sacred institution. However, some have the take it or leave it attitude concerning marriage. If it doesn't work out, then we'll just part and go our separate ways. That was never the plan of God in the beginning. If it doesn't work out, I'll just find another spouse. That's not the will of God. Neither should it be the will of man. If everyone had the right attitude about the scriptures concerning marriage, there would be no question at all about what God says. My assignment for this task, for this meeting, Again, is one that will not endear to me many friends. It is one that may cause separation. But I have to speak where the Bible speaks on this subject. And when I speak where the Bible speaks, I find that this shouldn't be too difficult as long as I stay with the scriptures. Looking at the text, as we look at the husband, we find that the husband is the head of the home. There must also be leadership in the church. And in order for a man to be a leader in the Lord's church, the very first thing he must do is have the desire. That's the, that's the number one thing. You, you don't put a man into leadership for any other reason except that he first has the desire. Too many elders have been put in for other reasons. I remember uh, that at a congregation, they wanted me to be an elder simply because there was only two. And if one of them were to pass away, then there would be none. But also with two, if you have the two that disagree with one another, then they want a third. That's not a reason to become an elder. The reason